welcome again as we come to time for the message this morning. Glad you're here, glad you've joined us, and uh, if you're watching this at a later time, glad you're watching it, and we pray that uh, it'll be a blessing to your soul. Uh, turn with us to Genesis, turn with me to Genesis chapter 32. Uh, sometimes the uh, Lord lays a message upon my heart, and I struggle to find a passage, but uh, it was similar in, in this case. Sometimes he gives me the passage and lay the message, but we're not going to tell the Lord what he wants to do. But he does what he does because he's God, and we love him for that, and we appreciate him for that. Genesis chapter 32, uh, verse 24. Genesis chapter 32, verse 24. And if anyone does need a Bible, we can get you one rather quickly. Genesis chapter 32, verse 24. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Wouldn't you like to have that power if you're on the wrestling team? <laughs> Ouch. You're out. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince, thou hast power with God and with men. I want to focus your attention right here for what God tells Jacob. As a prince, thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of that place Peniel. Or another place is Penwell. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Let us pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this passage. We pray, God, that you bless the message. We pray, Father, that you grace us this morning with your presence, Lord God. Put a hedge around this place, Lord God. And we pray that the Holy Spirit have free reign to work in our hearts and our minds and our souls. Whatever needs to be dealt with, Lord God, I pray, God, that we give the Holy Spirit the ability and the right to come and deal with us as he would like to. We thank you, Father, for this time. We pray you bless the message, Lord God. Bless those who are here, Father. And uh, bless those who are listening to this message, Lord. And all we can ask you, Lord God, is to do what you intend to do with this word. And use these lips for your honor and for your glory. And whatever said and done this morning may be honoring and glorifying to you, for you alone are worthy. And thank you, God, for this time. We love you, Father. We praise you and we worship you, Lord. We pray you help us this time, this morning. Receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, I want to give you the background of the story. News has come, well, before that, Jacob was told by God that it's time for you to return into the land of Canaan. And as Jacob was heading to the land of Canaan, news comes to him that Esau, his brother, was coming to meet him with 100, 400 armed men. So, when Jacob hears this, he becomes afraid. He's always been afraid of big brother Esau. Big brother Esau was the bully. He was the one who used to pick on him. Remember the Bible says that Jacob was a soft man. And Esau was a hairy, a hunter, a hairy man, a hunter. Yeah. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a hangry man. Uh, so if some of you if you know the story, you know exactly what I mean by that. So Jacob hears this and he sends Esau a gift. A bunch of flocks he gathered together. And not only that, after the gift he divides his family into three groups. First, the concubines and their children. Then, and then another group, Leah and her children. And finally a third group, Rachel and Benjamin. And the fearless leader was all the way in the back. Like the brave man he was, <laughs> Jacob was all by himself. Afraid of Esau. <laughs> Isn't that backwards? Shouldn't, that be, shouldn't he be in the front protecting his family if Esau had ill intent? No one. So, as he's behind, the Bible says it was evening, and he ends up alone on the side of a river as he's journeying back to Canaan. But during that time, it was divine appointment, because as he was alone, a man met him, the Bible says, and this man proceeded to wrestle with Jacob until daybreak. The Bible says this wrestling match lasted all night long, and... What I do notice here is that Jacob was willing to fight for this with this man because he was in fear of his life, but he was not willing to fight for his family. Isn't that interesting? 
Hmm. Now, another thing you have to keep in mind is that Jacob was uh, East, uh, Jacob was in his 80s as he was wrestling. He was in his 80s. How old was Jacob when he got married? 70. He was 70 years old when he married uh, his, uh, his wife, Leah, and Rachel. So he was in, 80, he's in his 80s when he was wrestling this man. But my, the thing that I, intrigues me is that he still had the strength to wrestle with his man. And not only wrestle with him, the Bible says it was, he was evenly matched. The man couldn't defeat Jacob. But this man, we know, was not an ordinary man. He was God in the flesh. He was a Christophany. And he wanted something from Jacob. It is always God who wants something from us. God wants you to get saved. He's the hound of heaven, we say. He seek, he's come to seek and to save that which was lost. God wanting you to get saved if you're lost. And if you're a Christian, God wants you to get right. Amen. I'm going to make this my meme for 2023. John 3.16 for the lost man. Hebrews 10.25 for the backslidden Christian. Now, if you don't want to know what that is, look it up. John 3.16, Hebrews 10.25. Yes, yes. God always wants something from us. It's never the other way around. God wants you to get saved, and God want, if you get saved, God wants you to serve Him. God wants you to serve Him. He did not save you for you to sit on your couch and put you on a shelf and look pretty. Amen. Well, you may be pretty. <laughs> I'm going to stop there. The squirrel, uh, get thee behind me, squirrel. I, tell, I used to say that a while back ago. I think I'm going to start saying that again. So this man couldn't prevail against Jacob, so he does something that we would say... He started fighting dirty. He touched the hip of Jacob and he dislocated Jacob's hip. He touches the hollow of Jacob's thigh. That's where your thigh bone is attached to your hip bone. Reminds me of that little song you said. The, I'm not going to sing it because I can't sing. And he touches the hollow of his thigh and dislocates Jacob's hip. But despite the injury, Jacob is still hanging on to this man. This was an intense wrestling match. The opponents were evenly matched. It went into overtime. Had it not been, though, for the man's supernatural strength, uh, Jacob may have eked out a victory. We don't know. The man says, it's almost daybreak. Let me go. I must go. But what, one thing that Jacob does is he says, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Yes. But now Jacob knows that this is no ordinary man. At the beginning, he thought he was wrestling for his life, fighting for his life. But when the man touched his hip, he realized, uh-oh, I'm in deep trouble. This is not man. This must be God. Jacob realizes that it was God because he calls the name Penuel. I have seen the face of God. Mm -hmm. This is an invaluable, invaluable place that every one of us must come to. We must wrestle for God's blessing. You must wrestle for God's blessing. A place where you realize that God, are, that God is greater than you are and a place that you, where you realize that you cannot go further until you get God's blessing. Have you ever come to that point in your life where you realize, I cannot go further, God, unless you intervene. I cannot go on, God, unless you lay your hand and show me that you are here. One, co one commentator said, it is a place where God conquers us. We know from Hosea that Jacob wept bitterly during this match. As he's coming to the realization that he's not wrestling with a man, that he's wrestling with God himself. Let me read to you Hosea chapter 12, verse 3 and 4. He took his brother by the heel of the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. By his strength he had power with God. Don't forget that connection there. By his strength he had power with God. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. You see that? Jacob was weeping, crying, as he realized that this guy, this man I'm wrestling with is God, he was not going to let go of God until God blessed him. He used his strength to plead with God. He used his strength to weep before God. And because of that, he had power with God. Do you see the connection there? In the end, Jacob leaves us with two things. He leaves with two things. He leaves with a new name and a blessing. Jacob is now given the name Israel, and he is blessed, while the man refuses to reveal his name, because it was not yet time for God to reveal his name as Jehovah. 
In Exodus chapter 6, verse 3, finally God tells Abraham, sorry, God tells uh, Moses why he didn't tell Jacob his name. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, yes. by the name of God Almighty, but by, by name Jehovah was I not known to them. Yes. So when Jacob wanted to know his name, God says, no, that's all, I'm going to bless you, but my name is going to kept, be kept secret. Yes. We call that progressive revelation. We know more today than Jacob did. David knew more than Jacob did. The prophets knew more than David, and the apostles knew more than David, and we know more than they all. Because we have the completed word of God. We have the completed revelation of God. We don't need anything else. We don't need visions after eating too much pizza to know what God wants us to do. God's general will for his children is in this book. And that's why it's so important to, 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 to study this book and to know this book. And the title of our morning's message is, is, Do You Have Power With God? Do You Have Power With God? I'm giving you the conclusion of the message first and then the message. It doesn't mean that you can shut off the broadcast or leave and tune me up. That's okay if you want to do that. I don't get offended easily. To have power with God means can you influence God? Oh, no one can influence God. I beg to differ, my friend. I beg to differ. God wants to be influenced by His people. God wants to change the course of history because of the prayers of His people. I've seen that through the Scriptures. And if you're a student of the Word of God, you'll see that over and over again. Is there something you really want from God and it is good? Then why haven't you received it yet? You've been praying for a while and yet no answer. Why? Have you ever considered that perhaps it is because you have no power with God? You can't move God? You pray and God looks at you and says, I'm glad you're praying. And God goes on with his business. Queen Mary of the Scots is said to have said, I fear John Knox's prayers more than all the assembled armies of Europe. John Knox is one of the Reformation's greatest prayer warriors, famous for crying out to God and praying, God give me Scotland or I die. When's the last time you said, God give me Orlando or I die? What we pray for is, God give me the next meal or I die. Again, I forgot to mention that on the 27th of December, pray about it, we're going uh, to have a fast for our church. Uh, if you'd like to fast, go ahead. We would like you to join us. Fast as long as you can. Fast begins at sun, when the sun sets, till the next sunset. Right? I got that right? That's how it goes. So make sure you have a big, massive meal Monday. <laughs> Eat the fridge clean. Probably a good time to clean out your fridge. I'm just kidding. And you fast as long as you can. Uh, if you can make it for half a day, that's fine. If you can make it for one meal, for many of you, making it through one meal is going to be a big chore. You got to, you got, we got to get used to these bodies to fasting. And I have to, I have to tell you, the Lord's been on me, after me, for a long time to fast. When I was younger, I used to fast frequently, but now I'm older. Uh, we get soft when we get older. Sometimes we get soft. We get too comfortable. We get too comfortable. I had a friend of mine who wanted his dad saved, and he would fast once a month for years. Once a month, he devote one Sunday a month. He fasted to the Lord because he wanted his dad saved. When's the last time you fasted for someone to get saved? Oh, I want my son to get saved. I want my husband to get saved. I want my cousin to get saved. I want this person to get saved. But have you fasted for them? Perhaps they're in demonic oppression or in the chains of sin or in the chains of certain demon. And that the only way that will leave them, the Bible says, is through prayer and fasting. Yes. You don't know what kind of demons they're up against. You may have to pray and fast a while. Even though all the power of God resides within us, many of us cannot energize this power. All the power you need is inside you. You may believe the promises of God, but you have yet to see them materialize in your life. You know that God's power is unlimited, and you wonder, Lord, why aren't you doing this for me? Why are you doing it for them and not for me? Remember one time I was having a discussion with an individual, and he said, why didn't the Lord reveal this to me? And my answer to them was, maybe he doesn't pray enough. Did he ever consider that? Why doesn't the Lord ever speak to me? Uh, maybe you don't speak to him. A power with God, though, I want to make it clear, does not lie in what we are, but who he is. Yeah. Let us never forget that. Yes. Yes. But at the same time, we cannot forget that God expects some things from us. I think sometimes as Christians we get so focused on grace so focused on that's all God that we neglect 
the things that He expects us to do. James 5.16b says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Effectual fervent prayer. That's all things that I do. Yes. There's nothing that God does. I am the one that has to be effectual. I am the one that has to be fervent. I am the one that has to be righteous. Right. And if I do these things, then my prayer will avail. Flippant prayer does not impress God. God hears those who cry out to Him, who pour out their souls to Him, who weep before Him. When was the last time you shed a tear while you were praying? Mm -hmm. Or just, uh, I'm going to butcher it again. I, ca I can't get that nursery rhyme correct in my head. Lord, I lay me down to sleep. Lord, I pray my soul to keep. And if I uh, wake before, if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Ninety percent, ninety percent. I'm improving. I'm improving. Uh, those are not the prayers that God wants to hear. You you don't know the half of it because I keep saying that every few months I keep repeating this nursery rhyme, and it's the first time that I actually completed it without butchering it, without mentioning the cow, or the cat, or Jack and Jill. Now, I'm going to give you, I'm going to bear myself open to you a little bit. I'm not saying this to be uh, super spiritual or braggadocious. I can testify that God has answered all my prayers. I've been praying for some things for years. The longest thing I've ever prayed for is 20 years. I never gave up. Seven years for this, five years for that, 20 years for that. I never gave up. Because I believe that God says, if you keep praying, I will answer. Yes. Yes. You guys pray once or twice and you give up. Why? Why? I found the word. One of the best ways you can pray before God is find the promises and claim them. Now, I don't believe in naming and claiming. There's a difference between naming and claiming. Naming says, I claim that this coconut tomorrow will produce coconuts. And tomorrow comes and no coconut. And I blame God. I claim the promises in the Word of God. Yes. That's what I claim. Yes. God says I will do this. I claim that. You see the difference? I believe in that kind of claiming. And I pray those promises. I, pray, I begged, I have begged God to fulfill these promises in my life. And I've seen Him do it. And at the same time, I make sure I order my life so that it may be pleasing to Him. Am I perfect? No. Are you ever going to be perfect? No. But you need to, as a Christian, you need to strive for perfection. Amen. You're never going to achieve it in this life, but you have to strive as though you can. Amen. But I endeavor. I don't give up. I press forward. I order my activities so they may please God. I make sure that He is first. I make sure that He is first. And I strive to be faithful. If you cannot do the simple things from God, you're going to hear me say this over and over again. If you cannot do the simple things for God, how do you expect Him to do great things for you? Oh, He is God. He doesn't need to see any of my works. Yeah, He does not need to see any of your works. Salvation is by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Yes, it's true for salvation, but not for everything else. That's where we get caught up. We never read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. God created you for good works. And if you're not doing the works that God created you for, then what are you doing? Then what are you doing? Yes, the Holy Spirit will do His work. But He cannot work in you if you just sit at home and watching the boot tube all day long and eating chips, potato chips, and playing video games. How do you give the Holy Spirit the opportunity to work in your life if you, don't, if you just sit there? You cannot. We mentioned this morning in Sunday school how the Israelites uh, received victory over the Benjamites in the first civil war in Israel only after they did the things that God expected of them. The first thing they did is they went to the house of the Lord. The next thing they did is they wept, they prayed, they fasted, they offered. And after they did all these things, then they got their answer from God. Perhaps you're not getting an answer from God is because you still have yet to do the little things, the simple things that God expects of you. And what we do sometimes is we ask God for this great thing, but we have been remiss on the little things that God expects from us. Words must be followed by actions. One preacher used to say, little prayer, little power. Much prayer, much power. Now praying three hours, now don't misunderstand this. Praying for three hours is not better than praying for ten minutes. If all you sit there for three hours is open up the atlas and read the names of the cities in the index of the atlas for three hours. 
God save the people in Cincinnati. God save the people in Philadelphia. I can pray for three hours if I name all the cities of the world. Then I can go around. We used to do that when we were younger. We used to go around. I, we prayed for an hour and a half. It was a competition. Who could pray the longest? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I open up the dictionary, I can meet you. I can read and read and read. And I can say, I prayed the dictionary. But you can pray for 10 minutes. That's right. And if you pour out your heart to God, yes. it will yes. be more effectual than a man who sits on his knees for three yeah. hours. Yeah. Let me show you that from the scriptures. Luke chapter 18. Turn with me to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, and I want you to see this. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but that's okay. I'll read it anyways. Uh, Luke chapter 18, and I want to read, Christ actually gives us the story. Luke chapter 18, verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood up and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I... He was doing everything right. Wasn't he? Everything that God expected of him. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Who do you think God heard? Luke 18, 14 gives us the answer. Yes. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Amen. The Pharisee prayed 34 words, and the publican prayed 7 words. Wow. Wow. If I ask you, whose prayer did God hear? You'd all say, yeah, he heard the publican. You see, the Pharisee's prayer was longer, and he waxed eloquent, yes. and he spoke in correct, improper English. And he followed all the gr grammatical rules. Yes. But the publican just prayed what was in his heart. Mm -hmm. God was not looking at the, God does not look at the duration of your prayer, nor of the gra grammatical correctness, but the heart which the prayer comes from. Right. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, the Bible says, Hannah was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And you know what happened? God heard her. He answered her prayer. Yes. I don't know about you, but I want power with God. Not to go around bragging, but I want, I want to know that my God is working in my life. Then why am I a Christian? Why am I his child? Why am I a son of the king if I cannot get the king to work in my life? Power is the ability to direct or influence the behavior of others over the course of events. Today we have people that are called influencers. These are media giants. They have millions of TikTok, uh, Messenger, Facebook, I'm gonna butcher some of these, YouTube, uh, Twitter, uh, Telegram, uh, Phonegram, uh, you name it, it's out there. Gab, Grab, whatever, it just keeps coming on. They're called influencers because they influence people's behavior. We have another huge influencer in society today, and that's Hollywood, started by the U.S. government, to morph people's thinking about homosexuality. Mm. And you know how they started doing it? Through comedy. Mm. Through comedy. Think about that. Mm. Uh, you may recall Klinger and MASH, some of the shows I used to watch, my parents right. used to watch when I was a kid, uh, or Jack and Free's Company, or the first gay character that was introduced on the Bob Newhart show in 1976. They made fun of it. And we laughed. But they were introducing society to this perversion. And people all, all over America laughed. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Well, well, something wrong with that guy. But this, they succeeded. They succeeded. 50 years later, well, almost 50 years later, the president on Tuesday signed the Respect for Marriage Act. Tuesday, December 13th. Making same-sex marriage law in the land. And I'm going to tell you that this was a dark day for the soul of America. Yes. This is a dark day for the soul of America. Mm -hmm. Leviticus 18.22 says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. Yes. It, is a, it is a bad sin. Amen. Right? Abomination. Yes, it is abomination. You know what abomination is? Something that God utterly detests and hates. Yes. Yes. It's not an alternative lifestyle. Oh, you can love whoever you want. You can love your dog, you can love your cat. 
doesn't mean you get to marry them. I love my gardens. We love our trees. I love my coconut palms. We're going to be building cages this week because it's going to get cold. I love my coconut palms. That doesn't mean I marry them. Right? People who need some, some brain cells. Now, we have to be careful. We cannot get mad at one side or the other because they work, both work together. Why is it that both parties work together to bring bad things to our nation, but when it comes to good things, they cannot agree? You ever wondered that? When it comes to signing bad laws that actually are bad for us and bad for society, they all get together and they smile and they laugh and they sign. When it comes to helping people who are doing good for the nation, they can't get along. Yes. Think about that for a while. Yes. Someone said, I'm not trying to be political here, someone said, one party is going to push you over the cliff fast, and the other party is going to get you there slower. They're both going to push you over the cliff in just a matter of time. Now, the government has power over our lives, do they not? And we listen to them because we don't want to get thrown in the slammer. Your boss has power over you because he signs your paycheck. Your parents have power over you because they pay the bills, they feed you, they clothe you, and they have a roof over your head. And I'm sure you do not want to go hungry or walk around naked and not have a place to sleep. So you obey mom and dad. In similar manner though, and we have to be respectful here, we, have, we cannot be irreverent, you can have power over God. You have the power to influence God. Oh, God is sovereign. He's going to do Yeah, God's overall plan is going to be unfolded. But in the little details, you have a part to play. Yes, God has given us 7,000, 6,000 years. The millennial is going to be in the seventh millennia, seventh millennium. Uh, Christ came when he was supposed to. He's going to come again when he's supposed to. The rapture is going to happen when God says it will. And all these things God has planned out. But you know, you can influence the little details. I can, I can influence the sphere that God has placed me in. Having power with God does not mean I get to control God. It does not mean that God is my genie and He grants me three wishes. But you know what it means? It means that when you're in a jam, you can call, you can pick up the phone, you can call Him, and He's going to be right there. Amen. He's going to be there before the firefighters. He's going to be there before the police officers. He's going to be there before the paramedics. Mm -hmm. He's going to be there before everyone else. And when you need something from God, when you have power with God, you know what? He's going to give it to you. Yes. Yes. You ever heard the life of George Mueller? He prayed for everything. He never asked anyone for a single dime. One morning they said that there was no food, and he prayed God, and he said, Lord, we thank you for this food that you have given us, that you're about to give us. The pantries were bare, the fridge was empty, and as soon as he was finished praying, there was a knock on the door. The milkman said, my truck broke down in front of your, my wagon broke down in front of your orphanage. If you don't drink this milk, it's going to go bad. And then a few, sec few minutes later, the baker called and says, the Lord woke me up early this morning and said that you guys needed bread. He had power with God. Amen. Psalms 84, 11 says, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he will hold from them that walk uprightly. Yes. And you notice the second part of the verse. Yes. Mm -hmm. No good thing will he withhold from them to all? From them. No. From them. To them who walk uprightly. Yes. So that's how you get power with God. You gotta do your part too. Yes, God's overall plan will be accomplished without your input. That's for sure. Did you have any input in the first coming of Christ? <laughs> Are you gonna have any input in the rapture? Perhaps, maybe. Are you going to have any input in the second coming of Christ? Or when the millennial kingdom comes? Did you have input in the creation? Evolutionists did. God waited for them to tell them how long it would take for them. They're, they're nuts. They're nuts. A man who has power with God will also have power with men. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4.18, Paul says, he's speaking to the carnal church of Corinth, and he says, Now some are puffed up, as though I would not come to you, but I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. Paul wanted to know, those guys are causing you so much conflict and trouble, who are trying to dissuade you and persuade you. Do they have any power with God? That's what I'm interested in. I don't care what they have to say. Are they doing it through the power of God? When one preaches without power, he's simply a talking head. Paul calls these people sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. He is just a noise maker. Have you watched any some of these videos and the guy rambles on for 10 minutes and you say, what did he say? 
Get to the point. Don't give me 25,000 flowery words to tell me uh, I went to the store. Just tell me I went to the store. Don't tell me about the traffic lights and the, bird and the grass and the traffic and the animals running across the street to tell me you went to the store. Say it. I want to quote something that Spurgeon said. If you can have your way with the master, you may depend upon it, and that you can have your way with the servants. The manless power with God must be safe. He must be safe. If God be for us, who can be against us? No weapon that is formed against us, such a man can prosper, and every tongue that rises against him in judgment, he can condemn. For having power with God, he shall be able to plant his foot upon the neck of his adversaries, and to reign over those who rebel against him. Such a man as that cannot be in want. If he has power with God, he will tell him about his needs, and they shall all be supplied. He will confess his sins, and they will be forgiven. God will deal well with the man who has power with him. See that? Power with God is not power against God. We know no one can stand in that position with God. That's not what we're speaking about this morning. We're speaking about this morning a man and woman who walks such a way that when he prays, God listens. And when he pleads, God acts. Not because that person, because God is obligated to. God is not obligated to do anything. But he sees that servant. Yes. And he has respect for that person. What did God look, What did God say about Israel when they were afflicted by their enemies? And he had respect mm -hmm. upon Israel. Mm -hmm. And he delivered them. Even one from Israel's counselors acknowledged that one cannot fight against God. In Acts 5.38 and 5.39, Now I say this unto you, refrain from these men. These were the, uh, the counselors, and they had just beaten the apostles. And let them alone, for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. Yes. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Thus happily ye be found even fighting against God. We only exist because God allows it. Every breath we take is indeed a gift from God. And if God removes his hand briefly from us, we will perish. Lamentations 3.22 says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. That is clear in the scriptures. You cannot resist God and win. If you fight God, you will lose. He will break you into a thousand pieces like the potter's vessel in the day of his anger. Therefore be wise and end your fight with God and be at peace with him. <coughs> Many of you Christians, the reason why you don't have the power of God upon your life is because you're still fighting God. You're full of anger and strife. I'm going to say, I'm going to repeat this again slowly. You're full of anger and strife and anxiety and turmoil and feel disconnected because in some way, form, or fashion, you're fighting God. I'm going to repeat this again. It's worth repeating. You are, if you are full of anger, full of strife, full of anxiety, full of turmoil, and you feel disconnected, then in some way, form, or fashion, you are still fighting God. You don't see it. The devil has blinded you to it. Yes. And, and you need to pray. And we need to pray for those people. One of the things I pray for people is, God, remove the blinders from their eyes. God, remove the demons that are keeping them from seeing the truth. Amen. Never attempt to argue against God or His will. Uh, you, you're, gonna, you're not going to win. And if you argue with God, you're not going to have power with God. Now let me ask you this. Do you desire, do you not desire to be as effective as possible with God? I do, be honest with you. I want God to answer my prayers. I want God to hear. I want God to know that He's moving on my behalf. And again, I want to reiterate the fact that all the power that God has is living inside you right now. Because do you not have the Holy Spirit? Is it not the Holy Spirit of God? Yes. Then if the Holy Spirit's God, He's inside me. Then I have God within me. Then I have all the power of God within me. Because God contains all the power. Unfortunately, though, many of us do not know how to use this power that God has given us. Spurgeon said, Without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are ships without the wind, branches without sap, and like coals without fire, we are useless. As many Christians today, they are simply living a nominal, a mediocre life. And if you desire to be more than just mediocre, and you want to have power of God, then I want to give you four points this morning. We're, 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 they're not going to be long. If you want power with God, focus on these four things. First, you have to submit. You have to submit to God. Two, you have to obey in all things. Three, you have to be faithful. And four, make sure you pray. 
You can live the Christian life. You cannot live the Christian life without fully submitting to God. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he shall flee. Yeah. Many of us, because we have not submitted fully to God, we are plagued by demons. Can a demon oppress a Christian? You better believe it. Yes. You better believe it. Can he possess a Christian? No. Because you are not possessed by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But he can, make, he can come pretty close. He can come pretty close and make you do some nasty things. Submitting to God means that you acknowledge His authority over your life. And you yield control over your life to Him. God does not require us to submit to Him because He's a tyrant. He requires us to submit because He's a Father, and as a Father He knows best. Do I not require my children, do we not require our children to submit unto us? Yes. Why? Because we know it's best for them. We mean we're not perfect. But we see the pitfalls of life and we want to steer children in the right direction. God is the same way. To submit to God means that I arrange my life so that it conforms to this word. I purposefully arrange my life so it conforms to this word. And it's not only one time thing, it's a daily thing. You've got to surrender and submit to God Amen. on a daily basis. You can't Amen. just do this one. Yes, people they have altar calls, I'm not against that. And people go before the altar and surrender to God. But it's not a one time thing. You have to do it every day. To submit to God uh, means that you pray, Thy will be done, not my will. In Matthew 7, 21, the Bible says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Now we know this verse come doctrinally is applying to the Jews, and the Jews, which were not serving God. And we are going to heaven regardless. But Lord, the point is, God wants us to do His will. The Bible has a great deal to say about submitting to higher powers. We submit to government. We submit to our boss. I keep saying this. If you treated God the way, you, uh, if you treat your employer the way you treat God, you'd be fired a long time ago. Think about that. I'm going to say it again. If you treat your employer like you treat God, He's going to fire you. And if you don't submit to the authorities, there'll be consequences, right? If I don't obey government, if I don't obey, don't obey law enforcement, the policeman's going to come and take me to jail. If I don't pay my taxes, the 85,000 new IRS agents will be gladly, uh, gladly visit me. Every time you act contrary to scriptures, you've got to face the consequences. I want to read you the story of what I mean by submission. And sometimes illustrations get the point across more than just some words. John Wilbur Chapman, born in 1859 in Richmond, Indiana, was a Presbyterian evangelist in the late 19th century and often traveled with a gospel singer named Charles Alexander. When Wilbur Chapman was in London, he had the opportunity to meet General Booth, who at that time was past 80 years of age. So Dr. Chapman listened reverently as the old general spoke of the trials and the and conflicts and the victories in his life. The American evangelist asked the general if he would disclose his secret for his success. He hesitated a second. Dr. Chapman said, I saw the tears come into his eyes and steal down his cheeks. And then he said, I will tell you the secret. God has had all there was of me. There have been men, and don't miss this, don't miss this. There have been men with greater brains than I, men with greater opportunities. But from the day I got the, the poor of London on my heart, and a vision of what Jesus Christ could do with the poor of London, I made up my mind that God would have all of William Booth there was. And if there's anything of power in the Salvation Army today, it is because God has all the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. You see, submission is directly proportional to the power of God upon your life. The more you and I submit to God and do His will, the more power we'll have in our lives. We need more Christians today who are uh, more worried about doing God's will than becoming great for God. And God. What God does with you is up to Him. All you need to do is submit. I can't tell you what God's will is for your life. I can tell you the general will of God. But if you want to know that specifically, you better submit to Him. Submission goes hand in hand with humility. Uh, the same reason people do not receive eternal salvation is the same reason Christians do not see the power of God upon their life. And it has to do with one thing, pride. I don't need God to save me. Yes. Mm. Or you get saved and I don't need God to direct me. 
I'm successful. I can do it my way. Let's see how long that goes on for. It is pride that will keep us from being fully abandoned to God. Yes. Once we humble ourselves and we see who God is, then we'll have no problem submitting to Him. Yes. Yes. I have no problem submitting to a great God like mine. Yeah. Yeah. The more you know Him, the more you realize who He is, yes. the more you understand His heart. And the only way you can understand His heart is by knowing His book. Yes. You have no problem submitting to Him. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Humility comes from a deeper relationship with God. When you, are, you and I are in constant communion with God, Yes, we take time during the day, we pray, we read. But you have to have a heart that is in constant communion with God. We call this being God conscious. Is God on your mind 24-7? should be. A lack of humility is the primary reason why we find submission so difficult. And you know what keeps you from doing the simple things for God? It's pride. Pride. Because you don't want to. It's not because you cannot. You don't want to. Unless you have a real medical reason or you're crippled, uh, there's no reason why you can't do the simple things for God. Even then, you can pray, you can fast, you can do all kinds of things for God. Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 16, 24, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and fall. We, we cannot even deny ourselves one meal. The next is obedience. A humble and submissive heart will seek to obey the Lord. If you're submitted to God, you know that's the kind of Christians that we will, that I can, I, I don't want to get in trouble here, but I pray for, I'm praying for people to join us who want to serve God from the will of God. That's what I'm praying for, to be honest with you. Because that's how a church is going to thrive. It's not numbers. It's not numbers. It's not about numbers. If you have the same heart that I have, and I have the same heart as you have, a heart that wants to serve God, then the church is going to be great. Yes. It's going to be awesome. Yes. You have to pray, Thy will be done. And after that, you have to pray, What is thy will, O God? When Paul encountered the Lord on the road to Damascus, and re he realized who he was dealing with, mm -hmm. what did he pray? Mm -hmm. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? That's the next question after salvation. Yes. Christians get saved, and that's it. They walk away. Glad I'm going to heaven. la di da di da They live their lives like they did before they were saved. Now they're saved going to heaven. That's great. I'm glad. But have you ever asked the Lord, what will you have me do? You pray that prayer regardless of the cost. And you should be willing to obey the Lord no matter what. You will go where he sends you. You will say what he tells you. You will hate what he hates. And you will love what he loves. Pierre Barlot was a gunner in the fort of Mount Valorim during the Prussian siege of Paris. One day he was standing by his gun when General Noel, the commander, came up and leveled his glass at the Severs Bridge, his looking glass, and he looked to the gunner and he said, see that Severs Bridge over there? He said, yes, sir. You see that little tiny shanty in the thicket of the shrubs to the left of that bridge? He says, yes, I see it. The general said, it is a ne nest of Prussians. Try it with a shell, my man, said the general. Pierre turned pale. He turned pale. He cited this piece according to the general's orders, deliberately and carefully, and then fired. Well hit, my man, well hit, said the general. But as he looked at Pierre, he was surprised to see tears coming down the man's face. What's the matter, man, said the general. Pardon me, said Pierre. It was my house. Everything I had in the world was in there. But he obeyed the general's command. He was willing to lose his home. Because the general said, shoot at that place over there. And he did. In Matthew 19, 27, verse 29. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my sake, shall receive in a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. We keep forgetting that there's an inheritance coming for us after this life. Yes, you're saved. Yes, you're eternally secure. 
The Holy Spirit has sealed you. He indwells you. But when you get to the shore, what are you going to have? I tell my children, my wife, I don't want the Antichrist to eat my money. I don't. Many of you are going to leave millions behind or hundreds of thousands behind for the Antichrist to enjoy. Oh, I need to plan for a tournament. I'm not against that. I'm not against that. Your power with God grows as your obedience does. Obedience also implies that you are living a holy life. For if you obey God, you will avoid evil things. And not only evil, but anything that seems evil. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 Abstain from all appearance of evil. If it looks evil, avoid it. In Job 1.1, 1, 1, the Bible tells us there was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job, and the man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. So what made Job upright? Just by Did he become upright by his Moses? Did he gain God's favor by just being who he is? No, because he purposed in his heart that he was going to walk uprightly, and he was going to avoid evil. He lived a holy and righteous life. Holiness comes when obedience is in your nature. If I want to obey the word of God, you know what the result's going to be? Holiness. It goes hand in hand. We're not talking about positional holiness, which comes through faith in Christ. When God looks upon you and I, He sees you holy. He sees you sinless. He sees you perfect. He sees you righteous because He sees Christ in you. That's called positional holiness, positional uh, sanctification. But what we're talking about is progressive or personal holiness and progressive sanctification. It's something that you do on a daily basis, something that you work out. That's why Paul says, work out your own salvation. He's not talking about getting saved and making sure that you get saved again and again and again. He's talking about make sure that you live a holy life. 1 Peter 1, 14 and 15. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the form of lesson in your ignorance, but he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. I said that fast, but if you look at it, Peter says, as obedient children, and then he concludes, be holy. You obey, you will become holy. Obedience is the pathway to holiness. God delights in a man who walks uprightly before him, and I believe God will therefore move mountains at his behest. The hymn says, nothing between my soul and the Savior, so his blessed face may be seen, nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear, that nothing between. Yes. Thirdly, you have to be faithful. This is a character trait that is lacking in many today, faithfulness. Yes. You can find few people that you can depend on. Uh, I have a friend, I know if I were to call him now, he'd show up tomorrow, and he lives thousands of miles away. He's a faithful friend. I know people that if I were to call them, they live five minutes away, they wouldn't show up. I know it. Because they're not faithful. They're not dependable. God is looking for people he can count on, people he can depend on. Proverbs 26, verse 6, Most men will proclaim his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find? We all know that God proclaimed David as a man after his own heart, but you know what quality about David that God was referring to? You know one quality in particular? Faithfulness. I'm going to read you the verse, see if you can see it. Hmm. Acts 13, 22. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Was David perfect? No, far from it. You know what? Saul was a better man in a way than David. Saul never committed adultery. Uh, Saul never counted the children of Israel. Saul as a character, as a character, he was, we can say, more righteous than David. But what's the problem? Saul didn't do everything that God told him to. That was the difference between the two men. God says, a man which shall fulfill all my will. If God were to look for a man to do a job, could he count on you? Would he pick you? Or would he have to pass you by? Faithfulness is the concept of remaining loyal to someone or something and putting that loyalty into consistent practice regardless of extenuating circumstances. You'll be in your place no matter what. Remember, I'm not saying this to, to brag again, but when I was in my uh, 
In the early 20s, I was looking for a church, a Bible-believing church, a church that believed the King James Bible, and a church that preached the truth. And I ended up in Vermont, from Montreal. So for two and a half years, Wednesday and Sunday, I'd be there in church, 70 miles away. I didn't care what the cost was. I didn't care that it was far away. I just wanted to hear the Bible preached. I wanted to hear the truth. I wanted to be in a church to believe the way you should believe. And it didn't matter to me how far it was. You know what the pastor said about me and my friend would go there? Because you guys are more faithful than most of our church members. And we lived 70 miles away. We were there on time. Why did we go there? Because we were faithful. We were determined to be there no matter what the cost. I'm not saying this to, to shame you. I'm not saying this to uh, put you down. All I'm saying is it's possible. You can do it. Funny is that one pastor said, oh, church is too far away. If somebody were to build a church in front of your house, you still wouldn't go. You still wouldn't go, oh, church is too far away. The reason why you don't go, I hate to tell you, is because you don't want to. Oh, it's too far away. Faithfulness lives out its convictions. It is a belief that is so strong that it changes every part of your life and you do whatever you need to do to adhere to your convictions, no matter the cost to you. I'm here, I'm here to tell you something else. God will not work through an individual who is not faithful. The story is told of various church members and their attitude toward the midweek service. Oh, and by the way, before I give you this illustration, you know what Paul said about himself in 1 Timothy 1.12? Mm -hmm. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who enabled me, for he counted me faithful... Put him into the ministry. God called Paul. We say, yeah, God called him. It was the Holy Spirit's will to call Paul. But one of the things that God saw about Paul, he was faithful. And therefore he called him. Don't ever forget that. So the story is told of various church members and their attitude towards midweek mid service. Now, uh, some churches have midweek service on Thursdays. So Brother A thought it looked like rain and concluded that his family, including himself, of course, had better remain at home, lest they get wet on the way to church. But on that night, it was raining very hard, and the same brother hired a carriage and took his whole family to the Academy of Music to hear Mr. Agassiz's lecture on the intelligence of the lobster. Brother B thought it was, he was too tired, so he stayed at home, and he worked on a sledge that he promised to make for Billy. Sister C thought the pavement were too slippery, it would be very dangerous for her to venture out and go to church. But she was seen the next morning going down the street to get her old bonnet done up. She had an old pair of stockings drawn over her shoes. Three-fourths of the members stayed at home. God was at the prayer meeting. The pastor was there, and God blessed them. And the persons who stayed at home, each were represented by a vacant seat. God couldn't bless empty seats. Finally, prayer. And this is the last point. We'll be done soon. If you do not pray, you will never have the power of God. A basic definition of the power of prayer is when you invite heaven's resources to intervene on your earthly situation. That's the power of prayer. When you have the power of God that you can invite those resources and intervene on your behalf, that's the power of prayer. Regarding the power of prayer, Ian Baum said, prayer is power and strength, the power and strength that influences God and is most salutary. Salutary. Hard. You know that prayer is a form of affliction? Prayer is hard. It's not easy. Fervent, effectual prayer is not for the faint of heart. It is hard to get on your knees, to fight the flesh. Sometimes I pray, before I even start praying, I say, Lord, help me pray. Let me fight this flesh that wants to get up off my knees, oh God. I so badly want to get off my knees, oh God, right now. I don't want to go sit on my chair and drink my tea. Yes. Help me pray. Prayer influences God. The ability of God to do for man is the measure of the possibility of prayer. The Christian man who is to prevail with God must be one who is terribly in earnest. Jacob was that way in that night of wrestling. He was determined, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And that's why so many Christians don't have their prayers answered because they have not learned how to grab a hold of God's skirt and let not let go until he answers. 
Cold prayers cannot even warm up a mouse. God, not, God does not listen to them. When you pray, you must do it with earnestness and fervor. Otherwise, you cannot expect the Lord to answer. Lord, please save my friend. Amen. I've been praying for my friend to get saved now for 300 years. He still hasn't gotten saved. I wonder why. Maybe it's the problem is not your friend. It's how you pray. The Pharisee waxed eloquent. But what did the publican do? He beat his breast. I wouldn't be far off if I said that likely tears were streaming down his face as he was beating his breast, saying, God, right. be merciful to me, a sinner. A sinner. Yes. Spurgeon said, some people, when they pray, are like the little boys in the street who give runaway knocks at the door, and off they go. They're little pranksters. But the man who prays all right gets a hold of the knocker of the door of mercy, and he knocks and knocks. And when there's no answer, he knocks again and again. And if there's not then an answer, he knocks again and again and again and again and again. And the longer he's kept waiting, the more loudly he knocks until last you would think he was going to carry the house by the, like a storm. And make the doorposts start, uh, start out of their sockets. He knocks so hard. This is the kind of man who wins a day with God. The man who will not let go until God bless him. Is that how you pray? To pray is to grab a hold of the skirt of God again and not let go until God says, I will answer. Just give me time. You have your answer. Just give me some time to work things out. I will grant you what you pray for. I know that for some of you, God may bring some dark clouds over your life. And you know, He does that sometimes to get you to pray with power. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the, dark, the clouds get darker, the storm, the winds grow stronger and the rain beats harder because God says pray please pray and he turns up the temperature he turns up the storm because he wants to shake you so you can pray with power so you can learn how to pray with power it's not something that happens overnight you learn how to pray with power the man in great need prays indeed to pray in power is to know that the only power of God can answer you there is no other way to receive an answer than through God Himself. You know that unless God reaches down with His hand and does for you that which you desire, there is no other way it will be happen. There is no other way it can happen. And when you know that, when you know that's the only way you'll receive your answer, then you, go to, then you get a hold of Him who has that power. And that is God. Have you prayed for a situation in your life in such a way? Have you ever prayed for a lost one in such a way? We must always surrender our will to the Word of God. And if we ever think that the certain course is best, but if God shows us otherwise, we must change course. Yes. You must allow God to lead you. You, ne you must never debate for Him in a single moment. When the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, you say, Yes, sir. When, when God says, Jump, you say, How high? Mm -hmm. Psalm 39, 9, David said, I was dumb, I opened not my mouth, because thou didst it. And that's what's going to happen to you when you have the power of God upon your life. The power of God can rest upon your life. I'm here to tell you that. And you and I have the same Holy Spirit the apostles did. The same Holy Spirit that was in Ian Bounds. The same Holy Spirit in Spurgeon. The same Holy Spirit in George Whitfield. The same Holy Spirit in Paul and Peter and James and John. The same Holy Spirit is in you. The problem is that you and I are not doing all we need to do to get a hold of God's power. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this message. Help us, Lord God, to understand that there is power to be had with you, Father, and we're not being irreverent, we're not being flippant, Lord God, but this power is available and you want us to use it. We want, but we must use it according to your word. And for us to have access to this power, Lord God, we must do some things. We focus on the work of God. Yes, Lord, you work. But you also expect some things from us. And help us, Lord God, this morning to submit to you, to obey you, to be faithful, and to pray, and to see you do great things in our midst and through us, in spite of ourselves. In the end, yes, we know God, it's all you. We are just simply the vessels. But if the vessel is not emptied of what is in it, then you cannot fill it. If the vessel is filthy, Lord God, then you cannot pour cleanness into it. Help us, O Lord God.
be vessels of honor that you can use us for the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray.